Hey everybody, it's Keith Rainwater again with Designated Drummer. This is the podcast that's happening today, and I have the most amazing guest in here with me, the legendary Paul Lime. How you doing, Paul? Um, I'm great, and I'm happy to be here, Keith. <laughs> that's so awesome. It's so awesome that you could come by here and spend some time talking about drums and drumming and your career. And well, sure, we've worked together for years. You know, with the yeah. band, with uh, Lone Star, and uh, yeah, so it's been a great. I'm happy to be here, and uh, yeah. I'm always uh, looking for an opportunity to to uh, <clears throat> talk to the guys coming up. I get a lot of calls, and uh, it's uh, just trying to find the time to do it. So this maybe this will cover a bunch of them uh, in uh, in one pass. That'd be great. That is awesome. So <laughs> if anybody out there is wanting to uh, thinking about going pro and they're they're a drummer, they've got the chops and everything, and you just want to know some tips and techniques or what it takes to play either live or in the studio or whatever, just as a career, playing drums as a career. This is the guy right here you want to listen to because he has been around for... Now, I'm going to throw something out here that, that you... I don't know if you know I know this, but um, Dukes of Hazard. That's right. The very first in 1977, 78, whenever it was, 79? Uh, I think we did Dukes. I started doing Dukes, I think, around 78 or 79, yeah. Right. And not only just the theme song, like just the good old boys with Wade and Jennings, but also the music throughout the whole... Series, right? Yeah, the ser- the the uh, scoring of the weekly TV shows. I did that. Uh, the actual, uh, we did a cast album where we recut that. Well, I've recut it many times with John Schneider, and uh, I, I actually produced uh, five albums on John Schneider. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, the original one was Waylon and his band. That was actually Waylon's band on on the original. Uh, uh, opening theme for Dukes, uh, but then of course we did it many times uh, throughout the show, and all the scoring dates, all the chase scenes, and everything. We did all that. That was my uh, my very first episodic series was uh, Wonder Woman with Linda, and uh, wow. so that was that was in that would have been in '77 when I started doing Wonder Woman. Um, yeah, it's a that was out in L.A. Of course, right? In L.A. Of course, yeah. yeah. So, so you you that, started out in Dallas, didn't you? Actually, in East Texas. Uh, East Texas. I'm from East Texas, a little town, Troop, Texas, outside of Tyler, Texas, which is outside of Dallas. <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, a s- small town, uh, and uh, my story is uh, coming from basically the sticks of East Texas. Is uh, a pretty. Uh, I'm I'm so blessed and fortunate to. Be right here, right now, because of everything positive that happened. There was a uh, gentleman that you met when you were 15 years old, I think, and you were playing somewhere, and he recognized that you had a really good, solid well, uh, he, meter. Yeah, yeah, Robin Hood Bryans. His, his real name is Robin Hood, and he was definitely my Robin Hood. And I've talked about him. I honor him every time I do one of these uh, interviews. Uh, and Robin Hood, uh, there was a summer series uh, that the head of the Park and Recs Department in Tyler, Texas would put on at Bergfeld Park. There was a, a shell, an outdoor amphitheater shell, and he would invite all the local bands. And, of course, everybody was, you know, Beatle fans at the time and and uh, and just the Buckinghams and all, all the groups that were having hits at the time. And, of course, we had our high school rock and roll band. And... Uh, and I came off stage one night from playing Bergfeld Park with our with our high school rock and roll band, and Robin Hood was coming off of Judy, and he produced Judy in Disguise with John Fred and the Playboys, which was a number one uh, Billboard hit. Actually, kept it kept uh, I think Think or Respect from uh, um, Aretha Franklin kept it out of number one, uh, and that was done in Tyler, Texas. What year would this would this have been? Oh, goodness. This would have been around 1966. Golly. And, uh, six, around 66. And uh, so Robin Hood said, uh, he said, kid, you've got a metronome in your head. How would you like to play on records? And I said, uh, I want to play anywhere I can play. I was 15 years old. So uh, my mom took me to the studio the next week and because I wasn't, you I wasn't a car yet. <laughs> I was I was driving in Troop, Texas, but I wasn't driving in Tyler, Texas yet. So my mom took me to the studio for the first time, and uh, from from nineteen that was that would have been sixty six. So from sixty six through seventy six, I did pretty much everything Robin Hood did at his studio for the next ten years until I moved to Los Angeles uh, on January the fifteenth of uh, nineteen seventy seven. 
Oh. And um, this was, I read a story somewhere, I heard you talking about a uh, incident that you had, and this is a really good lesson for people out there thinking about going in the studio and um, a lot of the mistakes we make along the way, we just has to happen <clears throat> as you were doing a, a track with your girlfriend at the time or something like that out in L.A. Oh. And you were, it was a session date where you had to read the chart and all that stuff and you got in there. What happened with that? Well, actually, my my uh, back up just a little further. My girlfriend is uh, still my wife. We've known each other since the first grade in troop, and we got married at seventeen in high school. So, what? So, Jean and I, uh, Jean and I are, are over fifty years married now. And so, she was a singer. Uh, no, no, oh. she was not. She was not the singer. She was, <clears throat> she was my biggest groupie. <laughs> okay, <laughs> she would right. help me. At, at all the club dance gigs we did, she would help me load the drums in and load them out, and she's just. Uh, She's she's one of my angels for sure, and uh, uh, but no the 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 session that went down in uh, in L.A. that was seventy or seventy one. I'll actually have to go back and look at my log and see what it was. I, I was around nineteen or or twenty, and I was the hot club drummer in Dallas, and I was doing a lot of studio work in Dallas, especially at Robin Hoods. Now at Robin Hoods. <clears throat> before that was before I really got in in Dallas doing all the uh, uh, American Airlines jingles and and uh, and uh, uh, Tom's Peanuts uh, commercial shows and it was all just with a with the hardest one of the most difficult writers I've ever worked with which is Phil Kelly and I learned so much from the from the from the Dallas guys that taught me so much about uh, in, interpretation and reading and, and how to move quickly in the studio. In, in Tyler, with Robin Hood's, we had pretty much time. We, didn't really, we weren't really on the clock. He would call and say, we're going to do... The um, first time I ever had to sign a, uh, a non-disclosure agreement is when a company, a large company that had com- sub-companies inside called Esso and Enco and... They were turning into a big company called Exxon, and so we did the, all the commercials for this new, this new conglomerate called Exxon. Uh, and uh, so I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement at about 17 years old, and I didn't know what I was signing anyway. But uh, <clears throat> um, uh, I got sidetracked. Where were we we're talking about, about the commercial uh, re- um, uh, learning how to read, learning how oh, to do these yeah. commercials and stuff? Yeah, and so uh, the guys in Dallas really helped me to, uh, um, uh, it, it was so difficult uh, with Phil Kelly uh, writing, uh, it, it was like a master class in reading. So, so what happened was, back to the story about L.A., I, I was the club drummer and band leader for a uh, lady named uh, Vicki Britton, and she was one of the top singers in Dallas. We played all the clubs, and we were packed every night, and everybody kept wanted to see Vicki Britton. She's a great, great singer. So I was her band leader, and, and uh, so when she got a record deal on MGM Curb, I think it was, uh, when she was going to go to L.A. and cut her single, and uh, so she wanted to take me along. Uh, and, I, of course, I was thrilled to go out and do my first session in L.A., and this was going to be a great thing, and I shipped my drums out. I am mean, not shipped them up. Took them on the airplane. You could take as many things as you wanted back then. Well, those were the days, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Put them in the back of a cab, take them to the studio, get them all set up. And uh, all of a sudden, these cases start arriving, these big cases. Larry Carlton and Max Bennett and and uh, Victor Feldman. And all of a sudden, these horn players start showing up. It's going to be a simul date. It's a full-on L.A. date. I was getting so nervous. I was scared to death. Uh, and uh, uh, we set up and we started to play the chart. And, of course, we played the song many times. I think it was called, the uh, name of the song was Flight 309 to Tennessee, actually. And um, so we played the song, and Artie Butler had rearranged the song. Well, any arranger that is hired to rearrange the song can't leave the song the way the demo was. He has right. to change it, right? Of Otherwise, he's worthless. So... <clears throat> uh, so uh, he had rearranged the song. I was so nervous that I forgot to open the music. Thought, forgot and to fold I, it out. I forgot to fold out the music and look at it. And and my reading experience was not that deep at the time. And I kept getting to the end of my music, and I couldn't figure out what was. Why well, everybody was still playing. Why <laughs> everybody was still playing. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what was going on, and I failed. 
I failed. They, they called Hal uh, Blaine, and Hal couldn't make it. They called John Guerin. John couldn't make it. And um, then they called uh, John Raines, and John Raines could make it. And I had I moved my drums to the side, and John Raines finished the session, and they got it down. Um, uh, they actually weren't crazy about what John played, and I actually ended up overdubbing on it when we got back to Texas. And uh, so it was me on the record, but... Uh, uh, I failed at the studio. So, uh, yeah, I was horrified. I thought my career was over at 20 years old. And actually, if I could have gotten to the Santa Monica Pier, I'd have killed myself. <laughs> that's what I heard. Yeah, that's what I was uh, talking but, about. But uh, uh, this hobo on the street thought I was cracked out on drugs, and he made me sit down, and he said, son, it'll wear off. You know, kid, it, kid, it'll wear off. He thought I was on um, LSD or something. Anyway, uh, he's basically I, saying, "Don't jump, <laughs> don't jump." Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I made. I called my mom, and I was, of course, just devastated. But I got back to Dallas, um, and it was the best and the worst thing that ever happened to me. It, um, and I got. Uh, I was working too much to go back to school. I called Ed Sof at uh, uh, NTSU, North Texas State University, and I said, "Ed, I want to come back to school. I need to learn how to read." And, he said, well, Paul, he said, I know you're busy in town. He said, what's your schedule? What can we do? And I, I said, well, you know, maybe I, could, maybe I could schedule one day a week. And he said, Paul, you're already doing what everybody else wants to do. Just keep doing what you're doing. And I went, okay, because I was already working. I could show you my book. It's unbelievable how much I was working in Dallas. But anyway, so I, uh, so I got Paul Guerrero, who had come out of North Texas, a great a great drummer out of North Texas and educator, and uh, he was the head of the percussion department at uh, Southern Methodist University, SMU. Wow. And uh, he said, Paul, I'll teach you how to read if you'll teach me how to play rock and roll. So uh, uh, I used all of Paul's uh, in, uh, uh, study materials, and uh, every day I, I would work. Every minute I wasn't in the studio or at the club playing at night, I would re- practice to his uh, uh, materials uh, that were very instructive. So uh, he would give you things to work on, mm-hmm. and you would read pages you and would pages, and sight pa- read them or whatever. Pages and pages and pages of stuff, and just learning, learning how to read across the, across the bar fills and and that kind of stuff. And and Paul Guerrero basically saved my career. Uh, uh, and uh, so. <clears throat> uh, um, yeah, so so I, I, I did that for a year. And then uh, as that was going on, I was getting better, better at reading. And then I started doing all Phil Kelly stuff and, and all the Tom Merriman things in Dallas. And uh, there was a huge jingle industry in Dallas. And I would be at one, uh, one studio uh, for three hours doing jingles, then another studio for two hours, wow. another studio for an hour, and I had to move my drums every time. Now, oh my this, God. Was, this was mid-70s or early 70s when uh, when Hal had come up with the Octoplus kit. Of course, he had all those toms. Yeah, all <laughs> those toms. So I had I was taking six or eight toms to the studio, and uh, and I was loading the stuff three times a day in and out of my station wagon, loaded, and then take them back and play five sets that night load them back in the station wagon, take them back home, move them in and out of studios all day long, oh back gosh. to this, back, and then play. I don't know how Jeannie put up with me. I was never, ever home. I worked all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, and finally, I started, uh, I got a buddy that had a van, Loy Crowley, and we started the very first cartridge company in Dallas, and for $15 a trip, he would move my stuff from one studio to the other. Then I got a second set, a studio set, and a set that would stay at the club. And so... Yeah. That's when uh, things started getting. Uh, yeah. I, I, and then when I started working with Doc Severinsen on the weekends, uh, mid 70s, that's when I knew that this was going to be for real. In what capacity did you work with Doc Severinsen? Um, playing the drums. Oh, I know, but I mean, in the studio, <laughs> was, it, was he doing uh, uh, no, sessions? Uh, or? Yeah, he, he was the band leader on The Tonight Show. I know that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, he would do. Uh, he would, we would do, uh, uh, like the Boston Pops, we would do the Cincinnati Symphony. Uh, he would come out and do a, a, a legit piece with the symphony, uh, and then we, he'd bring out our rhythm section from Dallas. 
Okay. He wanted to use the guys, our, our rhythm section from Dallas. So they were playing all, live they were to buddies. So, so we would set up with the orchestra, set up like this. They would back the podium up. We'd set up our, our rhythm section in front of everybody. And I, I would always turn around and pass out uh, cotton to all the fiddle players, right? <laughs> right. All the, all the, all the right. violin players. You're going to need and, it, right? <laughs> and when, I'd, when I'd turn around and start passing out cotton to the fiddle players, they'd go, Oh my God! This During is, the this is going to be par- this is going to be painful, but anyway, yeah. So I started touring with Doc Severinsen every weekend. In addition to being Vicky's band leader, and in addition to doing all the studio work uh, in Dallas, it was wow. pretty insane. It yeah, was, you could see why Hal Blaine back in the day had like uh, multiple kits that he leapfrogged. From what I understand, he would well he was playing one session. Somebody was setting the second kit up in right. some other studio, and he just kept that going. Yeah, that's what you do. You God. you have to leapfrog kits. At one point, I had two kits in L.A. and two kits in Nashville, yeah. and we would leap. And I had a crew here and mm-hmm. a crew in L.A. People that knew. How, now I remember seeing one time in one of your sessions here in Nashville, you have uh, some pic- some reference pictures in your little um, you know tool drawer or whatever right. that says here's how this goes and here's <clears> what that's set up. Right. Is that what kind of what you did back then? Took pictures and yeah yeah they would uh, if if we had new guys uh, come in then they would have to learn we'd do a tutorial for them to know how to set the stuff up. Uh, Jim Hanley has been with me for over twenty five years so so Jim has to uh, <laughs> that's my GoPro Jim has to. Uh, if, if he can't make it, then he has to show somebody else how to do it. As a matter of fact, the pictures, the very pictures you're talking about, I got um, uh, just, anyway, I won't go into the IRS thing, but uh, <laughs> we beat the IRS uh, uh, with, with those pictures that you're, the very pictures you're talking about. They, because I could prove that I was an independent contractor as opposed to a, I see. Okay. a hired musician. Yeah. Huh. So, wow. Yeah. Always take reference pictures of uh, people. Um, so let's see. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, studio work in LA. It's so much different now. Just to just to fill in a little bit, it's so much different now. Back when, back in the seventies, uh, we could have you could have a five night a week, six night a week club gig, and you know cover band stuff and or a show band stuff. You could do that pretty much in any city in America, Dallas or Houston or. <clears throat> Phoenix or, or anywhere, uh, and you could survive. You could get an apart, a nice apartment for 120 bucks, 125 bucks a month. Yeah, uh, and you could make 50 bucks a night. And I mean, if you do the math on that, a car payment was about 75, you know, 60, 75 bucks a month. So for a couple hundred bucks a month, you had a car and a place to live, right? Yeah, right. And you're making 50 bucks a night, five nights a week. I mean, you're making. It's costing you yeah. in your groceries. It's costing you two hundred and fifty dollars a month to live along. You know, with you can your, survive with your wife, now. and you're making fifteen hundred dollars a month as a player. It, 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 do that now. I yeah. mean, if, if it, the same reference numbers now to rent a, an apartment is fifteen hundred dollars a month. Mm-hmm. To to do the same numbers, you'd have to be making thirteen thousand dollars a month. To, to have the same comparison. Right, yeah. And there are not that many other than in downtown Nashville where all the guys are, you know, playing all the time and moving and doing all that. Uh, there's just not, there's not the club gigs to, number one, learn your craft. And playing cover tunes, you learn what everybody else played and why they played it on that record. Right. And uh, so then you start honing your skills as to play, playing around the vocal, playing to fit the song, because you're playing... You're trying to mimic when you start. You're trying to mimic what those of us that make records. I mean, guys now yeah. are trying to mimic those of us that have had hit records. And why did he do this at that time? And right. That's what we were doing back then. My heroes were first hero was uh, 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 well, Hal Bl- uh Gosh, uh, uh, hmm. it's right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, skin deep, uh, Louis Belson. Uh, right. My first hero was Louis Belson, then Hal Blaine, because uh, I wanted to be a studio guy, and of course Ronnie Tut with with Elvis, and which we got to be great friends, and he put me in that slot behind him uh, on the Elvis show uh, when uh, he was either unavailable uh, uh, unavailable to make the shows, uh, and then of course Buddy Harmon here in Nashville that was do- playing on most of Elvis's uh, records, uh, and uh, and and certainly DJ. And growing up to be close friends with all these p- people that I idolized, 
was was also a dream come true to be able to 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 work with Tom Jones when I was in high school he had Tom Jones had his TV show and he was just one of the greatest singers ever and I wanted to work with Tom Jones first album I get called for in in, in Los Angeles was Tom Jones wow so I told I told him I said you know I'd love to play with Tom live I don't want to go on the road for a long time but you know if he needs somebody to cover Six weeks later, I was on tour with Tom Jones. Wow. So that's it's amazing. just that's the way my career's always gone. I cannot explain it. Have you ever been a part of a band? Have you ever been a band guy? Like a, no, the a closest, band closest I ever got to being part of a band was uh, <clears throat> when Bernie Ledden left the Eagles. Bernie asked uh, Jerry Sheff, who's the bass player with Elvis, and James Burton, who, of course, was the guitar player with Elvis and, and Ricky Nelson, uh, uh, and myself, uh, Bernie said, let's start a new band. And um, Jim Ed Norman, at, uh, who was at Warner, Warner Brothers at the time, I think, uh, label head at the time, uh, he was ready to sign us because he was friends with the Eagles. He knew Bernie and from uh, Texas and everything. And all the Eagles were from close to where I grew up in East Texas. Right. I think they were from Linden. I think they were from Linden. Uh, and, uh, and I was from Troop. I think we were rival high schools anyway. Uh, but... Uh, so uh, Jim Ebb was ready to sign it, and it was called Phoenix. Uh, uh, Bernie named the band Phoenix, and uh, kind of rising from the ashes, right? Right, okay. Type, type <laughs> I see, yeah. So he named the band Phoenix, and uh, uh, I thought it was going to, you know, I thought it would be really fun, but I was starting to have kids, and I knew what the commitment, someone in a band like mm-hmm. you are, you're gone all the time, you're traveling all the time, you're promoting all the time. And I just made the conscious decision, which really pissed Jerry Chef off. Wow. Uh, I just made the conscious decision to stay in the studio. Yeah. Same thing happened when uh, in 1980 when uh, I had worked with Neil Diamond. Gosh, within two weeks when I moved to L.A., I was with Neil Diamond. A buddy of mine, uh, Doug Rohn, from high school, had gone to a Jerry Chef again. Had Jerry Chef was very instrumental in helping new guys come in to L.A., and um, uh, Jerry had taken Doug Rohn to an audition for Neil Diamond, and Jerry Sheff didn't get the bass slot. But Doug, we were sitting there, and uh, and Jerry had introduced Doug, who was one of the guitar players in my rock and roll high school band, one of them. <clears throat> and uh, and Neil said, uh, Doug, I understand you play guitar. And Doug just felt great. He he could have been a great studio guy if he'd wanted to do that. Anyway. Uh, so uh, Neil handed Doug a guitar. Doug started playing along. And Neil loved him, hired him, and it's the only job Doug ever had. He was with Neil Diamond for thirty. Oh, we did. And you were right there when that happened. Thirty-six years. I would no, I was not there. Oh. Jerry Sheff had taken him to that. But when I moved, that was about nineteen seventy-four, seventy-five. A couple of years later, when I moved to L.A., uh, and Dennis St. John, who was the drummer, uh, fell and hurt himself. Doug got me on with, uh, said, hey, Paul Lime's in town. Why don't we get him? So I worked with Neil in 77. So then when later on in 80, when they let, when Neil let uh, Dennis go, they parted ways, uh, they offered me Neil Diamond. And uh, by that time, my studio career was really taking off. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I was offered James Taylor, Lee Sklar, offered, you know, as, and... Uh, can I talk a little bit about the yeah. James Taylor thing? Yeah, sure. I remember hearing this story, and this almost made me cry when I heard this. And I'm, I might, I might break up a little bit here, but th- from what I understand, the story is who got the call to be. They needed somebody right away for James Taylor, I think it was, to hit the road and do this thing. And your son was five years old ish, five years old. That's right. And you said, yeah, yeah. What they said, if you can be on a plane tomorrow, you have the gig out with James Taylor. And then you were going to do it. You said, yes. You're on the phone. Can you tell me a little bit about what your son said? Yeah, uh, I was working with Lee Sklar a lot, who was the band leader for James at the time. <clears throat> and when Lee would come back into town, we'd do TV shows and records together. So we were very close. And, and um, so we were doing a, a movie one day and uh, as a movie for... Uh, John Williams, it was called uh, uh, Last Married Couple in America. Uh, Lee and I met uh, Natalie Wood that day, matter of fact. And uh, it was unbelievable seeing Natalie Wood. Most incredible eyes I've ever seen in my life. Anyway, so Lee and I are standing there, and he said, uh, you know, 
James is going to be cranking up again, and uh, I'd love it if if you'd go. Would you want to tour with us, with James Taylor? And I was like, James Taylor, wow. absolutely, mm-hmm. man. That that's. And what year would this have been? Around 1980, 81. 81. Okay. Yeah, so we just moved out, and uh, and I was doing Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell Sisters. Uh, every week we had a weekly TV series. I was doing uh, Dukes of Hazard. I was really busy, and but gosh, to to go on the road with James Taylor would have just been a dream come true, right? So I so I go home and uh, I tell my little boys, uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be going on tour with James Taylor. Or, and they said, well, Daddy, how long? You know, I said, well, how long? And, and I said, well, it'll be a, you know, it'll be a year. Well, Daddy, how long's a year? And I said, well, let's see, for a, for a five-year-old, what's a year? Oh, Christmas, <laughs> Christmas to Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, right. And they and they started crying, and I started crying, and it was like, oh my gosh. So I, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not leaving right now. So then the first day of rehearsals is what it was. It was starting rehearsals. I got ready to go. And I had my stuff being delivered, and uh, I got ready to go. They were standing at the door crying. They said, mm-hmm. Daddy, are you leaving for a year now? And mm-hmm. it was just going to be rehearsals for a month, right? And uh, I looked at them, and, and I looked at Jeannie, and Jeannie started crying, and the boys were crying. And <sighs> I started crying, and I went, no, nope, I'm not. I'm not leaving. <laughs> I went and called Lee, and I said, Lee, I can't do it. I, I can't leave. That's and such a touching story that you turned that down yeah. to... To be with your family because you already had a career built in. You didn't yeah, have to go. I didn't have to do it. A choice. So uh, a lot of time in my career, it's not been so much. I've been so fortunate and so blessed. It's not my career has not been so much. How do I do this? But my career has been more. Which road do I go on? I've been I've been so incredibly fortunate to be offered so many things that it's always been a fork in the road. Do I go left? Do I, do I go to Monte Carlo, and this is a perfect example. <clears throat> I was working with Doc, 78, working with Doc Severinsen still on the weekends, doing Vegas with Doc Severinsen. Doc Severinsen gets an offer to go to Monte Carlo, France, and, and do a month of shows in Monte Carlo. He was the biggest, biggest name musician in the world, Doc Severinsen from The Tonight Show in America. Wow. And, and I was working with him on, on weekends in Vegas, or commuting to Vegas with him on the jet. He'd get off the Tonight Show, we'd get on the jet, go to Vegas, do two sets at the Copa Room at the Sands Hotel where the Rat Pack played, fly back, I would be at Universal doing Battlestar Galactica or something all day long, Get meet him back at the jet, fly back to Vegas, do two shows, fly back to Los Angeles, and be with Lionel Richie the next day, and then get back on the jet, fly back to Vegas, do two <laughs> shows with Doc, fly back, and then be at uh, MGM to do a TV show called Chips or something like that. <laughs> then back on the jet, back to Vegas, two shows, fly back. It, it was just insanity. It, it, was, it was just insane. And so at one point, Doc said, okay, I've got this month in Monte Carlo. And I went, man, that sounds great. I'll, take, I'll bring Jeannie along. We'll bring the baby. And Jacob was just a baby at the time. I've got a picture of Doc Severinsen feeding Jacob a bottle uh, at, five, at five weeks old. Anyway, uh, so I, I took the gig. Michael Lamardian calls to do an Imperials album. Michael Lamardian at the time, uh, starting in late 70s, early 80s, was one of the most in-demand producers and arrangers uh, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles. Fabulous, unbelievable talent, and I wanted to be this. I wanted to be a studio guy. I didn't want to be Doc Severinsen's show drummer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I love doing that. I love show drumming. I love playing for a live audience. But my career track was to be a studio guy and to end up playing on millions and millions of records. That's what I really wanted to do, which, which happened. But I had made a commitment to Doc, so I went to Doc and I said. Doc, I said, Michael Lamardian has called. And I don't know if you know that name or not being in your world, but this, this is one of the biggest names in... It's like Mutt Lang now. Yeah, right. It's, yeah. it's like it, it, he was just fabulous. Michael Lamardian is just... To get that opportunity, you don't turn that down right. like, lightly. And so that was a fork in the road. And I went to Doc and I thought he would say, oh, man, Paul, you got to do... You got to take care of your family. You got to do what you need to do. He was like... 
he, my nickname was Hog. I introduced him to Lester, uh, uh, Lester Roadhog Moran and the Cadillac Cowboys, which was a, a <laughs> pseudo faux group of the Statler Brothers back in the seventies. It was I remember that it was, yeah, a, jo- it was, a, it was a joke band, but it comedy was, records or something made comedy records. It was funny, <laughs> so he nicknamed me Hog. So, so anytime I talked to Doc Severinsen, hey Hog, how you doing? So, so, uh, so he said Hog. He said, uh, he said, man, I. I really need you," he said. "I, you, you know, you do your drum solo in the middle. I can go change. I can get a break." He said, "I really need you." And I'm like, oh. "Oh God!" Not the reaction you were hoping for. Not the reaction I was hoping for. I was hoping for the fa- fatherly figure going, "Man, you got to do what you we'll got to do." We'll get a sub, and you can come back when you're. You, you know, come back when you, I'll get you a sub, and you can come <laughs> back when you. Ooh, it wasn't that at all. Oh. I, I, sh- I should have called. One of the other cats, I'd, yeah. and, and right away, and said, well, you, "Can you cover me?" But uh, uh, I wasn't in enough in L.A. at the time to do that. I hadn't been there long enough. It was only '78. I only had been there about a year. Anyway, so but to get this opportunity, so I said, "Doc, I'm sorry. I've got this is my career path. I've got, I've got to do this." And thank goodness I did. I mean, it was the right way to go. Uh, uh, I worked with Michael Amartian, and then we ended up doing several, uh, uh, his personal album, his wife's album, multiple albums on the Imperials, and then we did a, a, uh, a tune that was nominated for uh, Academy Award uh, called Glory of Love with Peter Cetera. Oh. So oh, uh, it was yeah. a... It was you played a, on Glory of Love? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. When, I, when I hear that, I hear you in that. I mean, because I, I remember you said you'd played with Peter Cetera right. on some stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you, that, you can tell by that that's a, that's a that's a early '80s drum sound because I'm triggering everything under yeah, the right, sun. Yeah, right. Yeah. Goosh. Gosh, and at the I like at the end of it gosh. when it does that halftime thing. Doom, 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 That that oh man, that yeah. sounds so cool. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, that's so cool. Boom, boom, I always boom, boom, uh, for a while there I thought that was like a Lindrum or something, some kind of drum machine thing. Because it sounds so precise. But well, that's you playing trigger, we got, triggering. We got to where I mean uh, it's so. Uh, after the long weekend, as James Stroud calls it, and the, the drum sh- machines were coming in, Jeff and John and all of us, uh, Jr. and all of us, we just had to start. Everything had to be perfect. It yeah. just we all concentrated on perfect subdivision. Now we're getting into talking technique, and and uh, I've been asked, uh, what? How do you define a groove? Okay. Yeah. And there are subtleties within a groove that you can that you can move things around, where you place the backbeat. Uh, uh, you know, I like, we used to call it the wet fish backbeat. If you're going to play it, play, imagine that you have a wet fish by the tail right. in your left hand. And as you hit the snare drum, where you bring your hand down, the fish actually hits late. Okay, it's kind of bending backwards it a little bit. It lays back. <laughs> so that was always something I wanted to try to accomplish groove-wise was to have the snare drum be on the back side of the beat, and it really helped me with uh, Ray Charles because with Ray Charles, it almost he almost wanted things to slow down as you yeah, were right. playing them. He right. wanted you so far, so far back on the back side of the beat. It just it was almost impossible. But the wet fish, the wet fish back beat uh, 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 was was part of what I wanted to accomplish, but. Groove comes from perfect subdivision of a bar or a phrase. That right, not yeah, right. That doesn't feel like it. Right. It's yeah. the same thing, but yeah, perfect like a machine, you know? like a machine. And then this we're perfect talking about in the '80s, where where drum machines, you know, an engineer or a producer yeah. has the choice. Yeah. Oh, we can use this Lindrum, which is. Per- perfect subdivisions, machine perfect, or hire this drummer that we have to mic up and we have to go through all this trouble of multiple takes and this kind of thing. Yeah, so at the beginning of that, everybody wanted, now now just a cheesy loop is fine for a record, which is to me is disgusting. But (laughs) uh, uh, there's so many records out there that are just cheesy loops now. Yeah. Uh, That's, you know, in my opinion. Uh, but, uh, uh, But back then... They would do the demo to a to a Lindrum or something like that, and I would even like on Say You Say Me. I even programmed a Lindrum for part of Say You Say Me with Lionel Richie. But uh, uh, then we'd go back and overdub the drums on it to give it 
some heart, to give right. it some feel. A human in there. But, and, but in that, the drummers, Jeff and I, and we had to learn how to be perfect inside of that. Now, if you go back and listen to records before about 1983, Hal Blaine was known for the, the records from the, the Shondells and all the, and the yeah. Fifth Dimension and everything that, that the Hal monkeys, did. The monkeys. The monkeys you know, and everything. Awesome. Uh, on the fade outs, you can feel the tempo kind of creeping up oh, a little yeah. bit. To Hal adding that last bit of energy to the record, yeah, right? right. And he was brilliant. Hal Blaine was brilliant at, uh, at making records. And, uh, uh, but you can feel the records moving around some. Sure. But it's okay because in the context of, of what it was and everybody else moved together, right? Yeah. And so it... It felt great, but uh, then after drum after Lynn was invented, uh, the Wendell first, and then the Lynn drum was invented, then uh, um, uh, perfection became part of the music. Right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Michael Britt. I was talking to him recently, our guitar player, Michael, mm-hmm. and he said that one of the things that he noticed that he read about about uh, drums and music and things like that is if something <clears throat> is regular, it doesn't change and it's just a repetition, then your mind tends to kind of erase it a little bit. It's there, but it's like you don't think about it because it doesn't change, and that either can be good or bad. It could be like you could concentrate more on the vocal there, Uh or maybe there's a guitar part or something, and it's just like sort of a, you know, like you just, um, like a, I don't know, like a deep pocket or something where it just kind of stays the same over and over and over and over. You don't really notice anything, so it kind of tends to erase it in your mind a little bit. And with a real drummer, Things change slightly here and there, so it's more in your in the front of your mind. Yeah, it's more engaging. Yeah, right. Real drums are certainly more engaging than a loop or a programmed thing. Although, <clears throat> the programming that's going on now, it sounds you can even do that. You can you, you can, can add, add in human stuff. You, yeah, yeah, you can you can humanize it. You can add in the snare drum changes a little bit. Sound changes a little bit with every backbeat. But the. Uh, but for artists uh, to think that they're being, uh, that, that they're allowing everybody else to be creative when you're playing to a machine, it, to me, has just lost it. I uh, just yeah. lost it. I won't. I, I enjoy playing with, I, I wanted to grow up and make records with everybody in the room all at the same time. My favorite thing to do now is like the Elvis Big Screen show. Uh, it's like 32 people on stage. Uh, Elvis is, of course, way gone but but doing a show like that where you're you're playing with a full orchestra i love working with tom jones where it's a rock and roll rhythm section and a lot of music going on all at once i i love yeah. that um you're driving tim, that ship yeah you're, the, you're yeah, steering that ship the tim rushlow big band when we did uh uh trump's inauguration uh uh the tim rushlow big band that was that was a real honor to be Part of that, and I played for both parties. I've <laughs> I've done the White House for Obama, and I've done uh, Trump's inauguration, and I did George Bush Senior's uh, the opening of the uh, the uh, uh, Atlanta Arena uh, that George Bush Senior was wow. at. That was uh, Billy Joe Walker Jr. and Matty uh, Matt Rawlings and Davey Hungate and uh, myself uh, as a rhythm section. What was that thing over in Germany that I saw a video on YouTube? You were playing with a band, and it had a lot of the Nashville guys in there, it looked like, and you were, it was in Germany, and some guy gets up and sings. I want to say he was singing in German, but uh, oh, and you, were, you were playing. You were, oh, the, there's a, they put a, that was actually in the Faroe Islands, and the Faroe Islands is, an, is a 17 island, I think it's 17 island, chain that's a colony of Denmark, and it's out in the North Atlantic, north of Scotland, south of Iceland, and, uh, um, uh, uh, Jakob Zachariasen is the producer over there, and he's come he's come over here, and we've done albums for them. They love American country music, and uh, uh, Holler Holler uh, uh, it, 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 H A L L U R pronounced Hotler. Okay. Anyway, Hotler Johansson, uh he sounds like uh, Hank Senior. He sounds like Hank Williams Senior. A great wow. singer, great artist, and they come over here and we do albums. Do they uh, sing in uh, foreign language, or do they uh, sing? He in can English? sing in English, uh, but uh, primarily over there they sing in his. Uh, he'll he'll either sing. He does shows in Sweden and, and Denmark as well, so he he'll sing in Danish, of course, in Denmark. But the Faroe the Faroe Islands has their own language, and it, wow. it's 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 one of the least known languages in the world. No. As a matter of fact, some of the. Uh, 
you know, you've heard of the wind talkers from World War II where, where they would use the American Indians to, to be able to talk. I, yes, they made a, a movie about that. Did a, yeah, there was a movie. I think it was called Wind Talkers and because nobody could understand the language. Right. Well, they also used Faroese. They would use Faroese interpreters so wow. they could talk and then interpret on each end. But the Germans or whoever listening, or the Italians or whatever listening, yeah. Couldn't under- make a word out of it. Wow. So, it so over there, they're probably not selling a lot of records in their own native tongue. No, they you don't probably make, have to listen no, to a lot of so, English. And- but they wanted to, uh, the, what you've seen online is is uh, they wanted us to come over. So we went over, we, uh, I put it together, and we took uh, Brent uh, Mason, uh, John Hobbs, uh, Paul uh, Franklin, and Davey went. Dave Hungate, of course, from Toto, went, and myself, um, and Brian. Uh, 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 a block. Acoustic guitar, great acoustic uh, grasser, bluegrass. Uh, uh, Brian Sutton, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so yeah, so we went over and did uh, several shows over there, and they of course they put it out. They're so happy to have us. They called us the Dream Band. Wow, and it was a Dream Band. I mean, John Hobbs and and uh, and Polly and and Brent and. Davy Hungate and my gosh, it's that a great, great band. You know, one of the things that I pretty really much the am- band that did your records, right? Yeah, a lot, exactly. a lot, yeah, a lot. Now, of, a lot of people don't know this. records. Yeah, and- <laughs> right. A lot of people don't know this, but back in the day when we were making Lone Star Records, Paul and I would split the duties, and it was his kit and set up. And this was when Dan Huff producing. That's right. Um, just uh, we would split the records up. I would play some songs, and you would play some songs. I'm not right. going to say which songs were which, which songs he played on me, because that's you know I, that's, that's giving up the ghost. But that's, that's between us. <laughs> But we would split the album, that's and it was, right. uh, it was such a pleasure to sit that's there right. and watch you play. And one of the coolest things I've seen you do, that's it's actually online, is where you're, pro- you're showing how you program that Yamaha pad, and you're programming kind of a loop type thing, and you're showing how that, and this is the coolest moment when you program that thing, and it's just some kind of real syncopated rhythm, like of conga slaps or something. It's like, book, book, book. And you program that, it starts looping, you just turn right around and you're on your kit, right? Because the pad is over to your left. And you get on the kit and you just start grooving with the kick, hat, and snare along with that little loop that you just program. And you, it just sounded like a machine the whole time. It was like the, the drum machine was a part of your body. And well, you were playing you, along with that. That well, just impressed the hell out of me. Oh, well, great. Well, thank you very much for that. That was very kind of you. I, uh, it, it, it becomes that way when, you, when you've when you've worked so hard to be able to play, try to play perfectly, as perfectly as I can, you know, and, and, and you have to work with that equipment all the time, uh, it, it, it just becomes like a, a fifth appendage, I suppose you would say. Yeah. So, so yeah. I got a question for you. I'm in the studio with Dan Huff. Did, did, he get, did he ever get on you about kick patterns as much as he did me? <laughs> Because you probably knew what you already knew. You, the kick patterns are kind of a thing, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. verse, chorus thing. Well, I would just play sort of, I was just kind of willy-nilly. And Dan Huff would always say, uh, hey, Keach, um, yeah, the kick pattern on the verse, if you could stick to that thing, and then when you go to the chorus, make sure that you that you, that you change that kick pattern and you stay on that kick pattern, because I, was, I wasn't doing that. Mm-hmm. And is that something that you kind of learned the hard way, or is that you've always done that? No, it, well, what you learn... Early on, making records is uh, the subtleties of what you're doing on a record, are what lift it for a ver, a lift it for a chorus, and then you know you might just uh, the verse might just be a simple half note on the bass drum and half note on the snare drum. Oot, god, oot, god, oot, god. Then you get to the chorus, mind, oot, oot, ah, it just lifts it up a little just bit, a little more it, syncopation. Just a little more syn- syncopation to lift it up to the next level, and then when you want to sync it back down for the verse, you have somewhere to go. Uh, uh, some records, especially if they've programmed, say, a Lindrum or whatever, if they program, they, they want it to stay the same for the whole thing. Right. Uh, if, they, if the artist has heard that and they're... And that what makes them happy. Then they want might want the whole thing. Right. I know that uh, uh, Indugu, uh, working on uh, Michael Jackson stuff, he would say that uh, uh, because of the programming stuff, that once he would play, they would want uh, him to just play Michael, or or uh, they would want him to just play the same thing the whole right. way through. Yeah. Not not any big cymbal crashes. Just. Just grew the whole thing. Yeah, and Indugu was a master of that. John too, you know. John, John Robinson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got called. I got called once uh, 
and I couldn't do it. I was with John Hobbs had called me. I got a last minute call and uh, uh, I, I couldn't take it. I was already committed to John. <laughs> I get to the studio with John and find out it's demos with John and I'd oh, already no. turned down. Oh no. I already turned down, uh, uh, oh, what was, oh, oh, he put out the calls for, uh, uh, for Michael. Uh, I can't think of his name now, but uh, he was a, a production guy. And, uh, and John said, are you nuts? Man, are you nuts? <laughs> you should have called me and told me. <laughs> I said, man, right. I didn't want to. I didn't want to bail you on you last minute. In L.A., a lot of stuff was last minute. I've got a story of a last minute call. I'm here in Nashville, which is two hours behind L.A. No, ahead of L.A. Right. time time wise. So, and we have a we had a fabulous uh, answering service in L.A. called Arlen's Answering Service, and they would find me in if they if I had a work call. Arlen's was like, they were unbelievable. They, they would, would chase you down, right? They would chase <laughs> me down. They'd find me in Germany. They would find me backstage in Tahoe, coming off the stage with Doc Severinsen doing a show. And in Tahoe, I'd be walking off the stage, and some stagehand would be saying, Are you, you're Doc's drummer, right? And I'd go, yeah. And he'd say, it's a phone call for you. <laughs> and looking at me like... Who are, are they you? calling here? Who are you? And you I, know the president I'd take or something? The, I'd, take, I'd take the call and say, Paul, service. I'd go, yeah. He said, uh, can you make uh, Brenda want you for Lionel Richie for uh, uh, Monday at uh, 2? Can you do it? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm good. So put it down, right? Wow. And, and thanks, thanks, dude. And handing the phone back. Well, I was here one day, and we had a 2 o'clock downbeat with Eddie Rabbit. So I, I'd rented a house here in Nashville. This around 1983. So I was here, so Brenda Ritchie, Lionel's wife at the time, calls and service, service finds me at the apartment I'd rented here for the summer because I was doing so many projects here in Nashville. And, uh, I, and, they, and so it was 11 o'clock in LA, it was one o'clock in Nashville, and she called and she said, Paul, Lionel wants to start at noon, I know it's short notice, but can you be here, can you make it? And I'm going, I looked at my watch and it's one o'clock. Right. So it's past the time when he wanted to start. Oh, right. okay. and so I call that the ultimate last minute call, past the time when, it, when he wow. wanted to start. Oh, and God. I said, Brenda, you know, I, I can't, I'm already working. I didn't tell her I was not in LA. Yeah. You got to be very careful about that stuff. So, oh, right. so I said, Brenda, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't make it. It was running with the night. So they got Jeff. Oh, be damned. So Jeff did it. So it was that was that was running. And uh, for those that and, don't know, and, if, Jeff, and Joe Chimay, right, uh, the bass player that did so many records with us, and, and also also out there, and with uh, uh, Lionel out there, and with uh, Colin Ray here and Shania here, and wow. the two bass players I worked with the most were Dave Hungate, of course, bass player from Toto, and uh, and Joe Chimay, and uh, either one of those or the other most. Uh, most for most uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of sessions. Uh, and you mentioned something about uh, you didn't want to let them know that you were one place or another because I think if if your phone rings enough times and you're not there, then they tend to pass call somebody uh, pass else. you over. And you get about, so you, you get wanna, about three yeah, chances, right? Two chance, maybe three chances to turn people down. That's and why like, a good session player should be in town and not on the road for six months with some band. Yeah, because and you have to be very you. careful about that. When I moved my family out to Thousand Oaks, California, I'd been living in North. We had lived in North Hollywood when we first moved out there. And of course, I was very close to Universal and and all the studios and, and Ocean Way, where we worked all the time. Anyway, <clears throat> but I didn't want to raise my kids in North Hollywood, so we moved out to Thousand Oaks. And I made a, uh, I, I got, you could, that area code was 805. Of course, LA was 213. So you could pay an extra fee, an extra charge for your phone to keep your I 213 see. number and transfer it into a different area code. Right, so it so wasn't I, a long distance call. I, when I they... paid the extra 50 <laughs> bucks a month so but people could still call, yeah. although they could reach me through the service. but. But yeah. so they could still call two one three and reach me in an eight oh five area code. Even little tiny things like that to not put anything in anybody's mind. To, oh, he's not here. Oh anymore. yeah, right. To to pass I mean, you over and to hire yeah, somebody else. Yeah. One summer, this was about ten years ago. One summer, I'd mentioned to somebody on a session, "Oh, we're going to move to our lake house for the summer." 
it, my, my lake house is an hour and 15 minutes from here. It's just, it's a commute, just a little yeah. longer commute right. than 30 minutes from Franklin, right? So, uh, uh, but I said that at a session, and about a month later, I was down at the Union picking up some checks, and, and Tommy, uh, I can't think of Tommy's last name, uh, steel guitar player in town, Tommy, Tommy said, man, I heard you moved. I heard you moved out of town. I went, what are you talking about? I didn't move out of town. I went to my lake house for the yeah. summer. Oh, my God. Yeah. So that, you got to be careful. You right? got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Because word gets out that you're yeah. not available or you're, yeah. you're not there for a session. Yeah. Um, so can we talk a little bit about working with Mutt Lang? Sure. Because that's just one of my, that's just fascinating to me how. Uh, uh, we're not boring your folks, are we? Oh, no, not at all. No. Um, this is this is very very <clears throat> exciting stuff. It's, it's, I've been waiting to talk to you for a long time. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know if a lot of people know that Paul played on all of Shania's stuff. You know, back in the early days, um, all that those big hits from Shania you, that you're hearing Paul Lyme, um, except for the Up album, which was all in the box. It was programmed. Yep. Except there's one song you were telling me that. Uh, you played brushes on or something like that or you, uh, uh, and then <laughs> Mutt Lang actually um, Forever and uh, Forever and Always Forever and Always yeah, yeah. that one yeah. is actually you playing but he you got paid for the session but you never even stepped one foot in the studio because he used your uh, files to yeah he used the files and he called me and he said uh, I'm going to use your part from another record uh, they changed the tempo a little bit and uh, but I'm going to use yours but I'm I'm going to file you know, I'm gonna you know have them file a contract for you so you get paid again. Yeah, you got paid and, like per diem and the whole the yeah, whole nine yards. Well, right? I don't know about per diem, but uh, I certainly got paid double scale to <laughs> to cool. be on the record. And it was just a chit chit if you've ever heard. But yeah, that song from I'm the only I'm the only drummer on Up, but right. but I really didn't play on Up. They used one of the tracks from my. I, I, actually, I went back and figured out which one it was, and I can't figure out which one it is. But now. since you actually legally, since you actually it was your hand hitting a drum. Literally, and they just they use my just reappropriated and, and, and you're, that's you. You perform you perform yeah, that yeah, in so, some way. So I'm the only drummer on all of Shania's records. Right. Well, not not the new ones now that she's yeah. making now that that are not doing. Uh, you know. Anyway, it's not like it used to be. Uh, but yeah, her first record before Mutt start producing uh, it was uh, uh, Harold uh, Harold Shedd and Nora Wilson were producing that record, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, like I like I mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking, she wanted to do her own material, and of course she's this new young girl from. Or, well, she actually wasn't that young at the time, but anyway, she's a new singer from Canada, and so they 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 put in Nashville songwriter songs, and you know we'll see how this goes, and and uh, you know it didn't didn't really do that well, uh, uh, but then her meeting Mutt. And then Mutt getting excited about her, um, and uh, then him co-writing with her right. uh, took her musicality and her writing skills to a whole other level. Then having Mutt involved, um, of course, uh, Mutt was a star in his own right. Right. Needless to say, one of the most successful pop producers. Uh, in the history, yeah, we're talking ACDC, Foreigner, yeah. uh, Billy Ocean, uh, yeah, uh, that's crazy. Uh, Brian Adams, Brian uh, Adams, uh, yeah, just an incredible producer. Uh, you know, in the uh, even higher than a league of David Foster, but David Foster and and Mutt Lang are in the same categories, being as successful as producers. Uh, so, uh, so um, Luke uh, Luke Lewis who was the president of Mercury Records, Nashville, where Shania was signed at the time. Uh, of course, he was all into that because Luke Lewis was a rock and roller uh, and, uh, and a star. You know, I, you don't have to play music to be a star rock and roller in my book. Uh, Linda Carter's husband, uh, um, Robert Altman, is, was the finest rock and roller I ever knew, uh, and uh, he didn't play anything, just... Uh, Wow. Unfortunately, he passed away about eight months ago, which just broke all of our hearts. But yeah. uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man and the ultimate rock and roller. But uh, anyway, um, so Luke Lewis, who was head of uh, um, Mercury Records, uh, believed in this. So we started we started the record and we, we did the record. And uh, um, they almost, it, it almost, because her first record was just kind of so-so, Country radio didn't know Mutt that well, 
So Luke went on, went, and he said, look, give me X amount of dollars. I'll break this record. If I don't break this record, you can have my job. I'll, you can cancel my contract. Wow. That's, that's how much that Luke believed in it. And he went, when he got, uh, I think it was, what was the first hit we did? Was it Boots? We, the first hit with Shania, was it Boots? Yeah, either that or, or Honey, I'm Home. Or, maybe, I mean, honey, not, not, maybe it was Honey, I'm Home. I mean, what or, am I thinking? Uh, Any Man of Mine was the first thing I remember ever hearing. Maybe it was, it was like Man big radio. Oh, know. the, the uh, yeah, we did the, uh, the, uh, the Queen thing. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, God. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's cool. Right. And so, you can actually hear that's kind of a program thing, and then you can hear when your actual drums kind of come in right. halfway through that verse, right? Yeah, Before the so chorus. I used... Uh, I used about four bass drums on the boom, boom, and uh, every hand clap sample I had for the boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> whack, yeah. boom, boom, whack. And I like the, the, the uh, in between the subdivisions, do ch doom da ch do ch doom da kind of had a neat little, I don't know what it was, like yeah. um, shaker sound. Well, it, it, was a, it was kind of a, a Louisiana half shuffle. Uh, yeah. It, 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 an insinuated half shuffle. I love talking was about that. Was that a Mutt Lang decision, or was that something you brought to the table? Uh, no, well, it, well, he demoed everything kind of ahead of time, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, well, kind of. He, he would play it on guitar, and he had a little bit of a lilt yeah. to his playing. So instead of, it, it just felt better having, yeah. a, having a lilt to it. Uh, not all the way over to a swing, but kind of a... Kind and then when the chorus kicks in, it's totally, yeah. it totally shifts gears to that, right. yeah. that double time thing. Yeah. That's really fun. And then it turns into a two beat, yeah. Yeah, and Which so I thought... I thought it was kind of corny. <laughs> yeah, when it came, you know. But the, I thought, the, I thought when we cut, she thinks my tractor's sexy. I thought that was corny too. But yeah. my best friend, my brother, Paul Overstreet, wrote the song. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's like wow. a brother to me. But uh, Paul wrote the song. But I thought when we, I thought when we cut, she thinks my tractor's sexy on Kenny Chesney. I thought, oh boy, this is. I I just didn't get I didn't get it. Yeah, <laughs> but it's one of his biggest records he's ever had. Yeah, I know. I didn't when that song first came out too. I thought it was kind of corny. Like she I, thinks my tractor's sexy, but I kind of after listening yeah. to it, I kind of got it. You know, yeah, never over. Never mind. And I did you do ahead. the overdub on the toms? The the thing that you do with Shania a lot of times, where you you know you, yeah. you lay down the first track and you go in later and you do doom 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 yeah doom 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 doom. You're right. kind of known for that in a way. You're like yeah. Well, I think yeah, I've even heard uh, you reference it's like there, the Shania thing. Yeah, there's a there's a way to stick that where where I could do it all together all i can do it in one pass when i do clinics and i do a hit snippets package and play along with ah. the hits i played on i i i've i figured it out how to how to stick that now and do it all together do all it live right but when we did that uh i doubled them i was doing boom 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 yeah and that went yeah. back and i went back and doubled them we went back yeah. and doubled them. i like all your terminology that you've sort of taught me along the way like the batman and stuff like that batman, you know like right. like when you have a, a song that goes do 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 yeah or that, that's your yeah. Yeah. yeah and i think as pro drummers we'd learn these things along the way the language there's a whole yeah. language that you use in the studio even different from live in the studio you yeah. use all this language that you no have. that's right that's right and 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 uh, traditional M music, music, uh, mu musicality doesn't doesn't appreciate what what how we used shortcuts and acronyms uh, to move quickly. You know, uh, in in traditional music, it would have been okay. That's going to be a uh, two, that's going to be a quarter note uh, uh, dotted half. Okay, quarter note dotted half. All right, quarter note dotted okay. half. It's easier to say, okay, guys, Batman on that one, okay? Now <laughs> right. let's move on. Right. Ba, ba, yeah. da, 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 and you know what you're talking about. Batman. Yeah, you it's know exactly. It's a, yeah. it's a quarter note. And there, the other one is uh, Charleston. Okay, we're going to play Charleston on that. Uh, so, doom, ba, doom, ti, ba, do, one, and ba. Well, it comes from the old song where they do the Charleston. Bumped, bumped. I got that from all the, the guys in Dallas um, that came ahead of me, the big band guys and everything. We worked with Doc Severance, and I was the kid after Ronnie Tut left Dallas, and I was the, the kid coming up, and when Ronnie left in 69 and went with Elvis, then I was the kid that kind of, 
I was a Ronnie Tuck fan, and I kind of modeled my young playing after Ronnie. And so when I started getting in in Dallas, they went, "Oh man, we got a new, we got a young Ronnie Tuck here. This is great." <laughs> oh wow! Oh, I can show you a picture of Ronnie Tuck from about 1965 when he was a studio geek in Dallas. You wouldn't recognize him. Wow. <laughs> then, then, of course, you, the guys in L.A. that were very successful. I never really worried about branding much. I've always had my it, this is this is what it is. But what Lee, you see is what you Lee, get. Lee Sklar is in. Oh, yeah. got his father right, time look. He's got his father time look, and Ronnie, of course, got his long hair and his beard and everything. But the, uh, so they kind of brand themselves, which is good. Uh, yeah. They become a you know. You can see them from far away and know who they are. You know who they are. You know. You, you know you get to a certain level in this business, and uh, 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 you know Rich Redmond has done a. He's done a job of branding himself. Right, yeah. So He's, uh, he's all about Rich Redmond. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, Rich, what's up? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, so at, at a particular, you get to a particular level, it's it, it's good to start, you know, people start knowing you for a certain thing. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've done so many things from big band to country to pop to jazz records to, uh, it's, I'm, I, you know, I won the country drummer of the year, Modern Drummer Magazine, eight years in a row, and they wouldn't let me particip- They wouldn't let me win anymore after that. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, country drumming is only one of the things I've done. I mean, mm-hmm. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've done presidential inaugurations with big bands. You know, so. I'm just trying to picture in the studio doing television, doing like in the in the '70s or '80s, and <clears> looking <throat> at these notes, like it's just like what we call fly shot fly shit. <laughs> Um, it's just notes everywhere, and like, yeah. how do you sight read? How do you even know where to start on that? You know, not to even to mention the Nashville chart system, the Nashville number system, which you had to learn. Yeah, you know, when I got here, it's I like had to we learn all that. did. We yeah. all did that. We came to Nashville, like, what do these numbers mean? You know. Yeah. Well, when you're doing a uh, Tommy Tedesco, that I worked with a tremendous amount doing T after, after his record career was kind of over. He, he, of course, did a lot of movies. We did a lot of movies and TV Guitar shows. player, right? Mm-hmm. From yeah. Buffalo, is that right? Because I listened I, to the... He's New York. He's definitely... Yeah, I listened to the... Um, the Well, it was a audio book about the um, the Wrecking Crew. Yeah. And it was talking about how he grew up in Buffalo. And I think it was Tommy Tedesco. Yeah. Sure. So I was one of the guys that came in behind Hal mm-hmm. uh, when, you know, uh, when it, 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 somebody always comes in. Yeah, there's always Some, the next guy. Always the next guy. So I was... I was one of the next guys, and I started doing all the the TV shows and the and the uh, the TV specials and all all that stuff. And uh, not all of them, but many of them. Michael Jackson and Diana Ross and. And the, from what I understand, the pay so, scale on that is is totally different than if you're playing like on a record or doing a regular session date. Well, yeah. especially if it's a TV commercial or something like that. Yeah, the the union negotiates a contract for every genre of production, not genre of music, genre of production. So, uh, for records, there's a record contract. You're working under a record contract, and you get paid X amount of dollars for the record contract. Now, uh, the reason that some of us, uh, those at the top of the craft, making hit records, we we were able to charge double what the scale was, because if a kid right out of high school gets called to do a record, he gets paid uh, whatever the scale is, say, yeah. it, say it's two, 250 bucks for a session. If he's right out of high school, due to the union contract, you have to pay him 250 bucks. Right. But here you got a guy that's on 100 million program. records. Right. He's, you know, he's, he's got to be able to charge more. He's going to bring something else to the table. So at right. the time, uh, not anymore because record sales are so horrible because of the internet right. uh, and technology, but we were able to charge double that. And uh, they were happy to pay it to get us because we were working. I mean, working all the time but so you have a record contract that you're working under or if you're doing a um, a videotape show like like Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell sisters or Dick Clark's bloopers and practical jokes that was a videotape agreement which was the best agreement to play under because if they used the music again you didn't have to be there they would just use the music again Ah, and so you would go in and uh, do Dick Clark's bloopers and practical jokes. You do a one four-hour call. You'd make six hundred bucks for the first call, and you get four hundred and fifty dollars a week for the next year. 
wow. for just doing that one thing. Wow. That was the best contract to work under, is the videotape agreement. Television is a whole other And thing. television, a motion picture television agreement, that was another separate thing. That would have been when, if you did a um, uh, uh, scoring date for Star Wars, or if you did Star Wars or or The River, uh, I'm just trying to think of things I played on, Any anything, uh, The River or Star Wars or uh, anything under a, a television, a motion picture agreement, it, it, it was the same contract as we would do with Dukes of Hazard, right. or we would do with Wonder Woman or Battlestar Galactica. Mm-hmm. So that was a separate contract you worked, worked under. And what the union had done under that contract was uh, pushed for and negotiated for what was called 100% scoring. So you couldn't every week, and it wasn't for our benefit. I'd sooner work under the videotape agreement. Right. It wasn't for our benefit. It was for the benefit of all the staff at Universal, all the tape copyists, uh, uh, all the tape ops, uh, all the uh, music copyists, uh, uh, the writers, everything. Everything had to be done every week. And it was to keep everybody that was on staff at Universal, MGM, to keep their staff working. So they would charge the production house every week. So every every week you saw Wonder Woman, we would go in and we would redo the music again. Oh, wow. They could not use the music from last week, oh, although it was the same music. Wow. So we had to go in and recut it. It's called 100% scoring. So you had to be there every week wow. and recut everything. So Dukes of Hazard recut the music. And they would change it up a little yeah. bit. Uh, I think I've actually heard that before, where I would yeah. watch a series and I would hear something a little bit Just different a little than bit you different. did last yeah. week. So, so then the writer got to rewrite, rescore. The copyist got to recopy. Is that right? The tape, the engineer got to re-engineer. The you know, but the greatest contract to work under was that videotape video agreement. Because wow. we did Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell Sisters for three, I think we did it three years in a row, and it re-ran at cable for for, uh, I think, five or six years. Wow. So I got paid 75% of what I made the first time, say 600 bucks. Every week. I got $400, $450 a week, every week, for the next three years wow. from having done that one. So you hear that, folks? It's yeah, but... She, well, <laughs> that doesn't to, happen anymore travel now. back in time, but... Yeah, it's, it's traveling back now. in time. That's that's why I say things are so much different now. Back when I was starting, it was a, it was a magical time. You could learn your craft play every night of the week, have a nice apartment and a nice car. Then I was in the, and then coming through studios in LA studios and in Nashville, I was in the golden era uh, of when those of us make, send it, bidding it being on hundreds of millions of records that we're selling, being able to charge double scale and uh, working for everybody all the time. Um, and it just seemed like no end in sight. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, now it's different. There are, uh, other than downtown Nashville, there are no club gigs in five nights a week in Peoria, right. Illinois. They've got a DJ. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's. Uh, That's what drove me to Nashville. Is, is a lot of us that, that lived in the Dallas area, playing mm-hmm. all the clubs around Dallas yeah. in the you Start, know, late uh, late eighties, early nineties. They started going to DJs yeah. and all the clubs, not all of them, but most of the clubs that we made a living at playing yeah. the circuit around Dallas and in Texas uh, dried up. And it was like, well, let's go to Nashville and see if we can get sure. with like a recording that's, artist. That's the hardest part about when, when guys ask, you know, how do I get started? How do I get in? Well, I, on the video thing I did for online, I kind of explained why it's so hard to get in on the Vic Firth uh, video we did. Uh, it, it's just they've only got the money to spend one time, so they get the guys that they know c- can make a hit record. Right. Uh, that's why it's so hard to get in. Not that you can't get in. It's just that's why it's so hard to get in. Yeah. Because they only have the budget to spend once. Uh, so that's a simple answer for why it's so hard to get in. Uh, but but how to get started? The 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 elements that were in place when I got started, those elements are not even in place anymore. I mean. Nobody sells a million CDs anymore. Right. They're downloads. And the songwriters are having a hard time getting paid for the plays that are on the Internet that nobody really knows how many times it was played, although they should. Uh, and so, I mean, everything, unfortunately, everything in the music business is it's gone back to a singles business. Yeah. It's not an albums business Like it was anymore. in the 50s, right? 50s, you bought a in single. The 50s. And, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, what happened in, uh, you never saw a James Taylor single. If you wanted a new James Taylor record, you had to buy the album. Right. Well, that was the bigwigs in New York going, hey, wait a minute. Why don't we buy up all the publishing companies, and instead of selling them just one song, we'll sell them ten songs. Right. And we'll give them a, we'll give them a deal instead of instead of it being two dollars for, or you know we'll no I, I, you know I'm making this up as I go. No. But anyway, we're going to force them to buy all ten. Right. And I remember my kids growing up said, Dad, I really like that record, but why do I have to listen to the whole rest of the album to yeah. get to the one I like? Right. Well, they figured out how to do that. Even now. on iTunes, when you see iTunes now, there's like a song like, for instance, Peter Frampton's, uh, you know, the Frampton Comes Alive. If you want to listen to, you know, uh, Do You Feel Like I Do, you got to buy the whole album. They have that sort of programmed in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Must buy album, you know, and there's all the singles that you can buy for $1.99 or whatever. But if you want to listen to Do You Feel Like I Do, the most popular song, you have to buy the whole album. Really? It's kind of, yeah. <clears throat> a lot I of things like I that. I didn't realize that. So that same, the same deal is in play. The yeah. same people made that happen. Well, yeah, it's, uh, and, and it's all about the publishing. It's all about the money. Right. Now, you talked about, um, you've always talked about uh, being a session drummer and getting in there, and I've heard you mention this before about keeping the session going. And, and you know, the reason they call you mm-hmm. is, is you get in there, you don't drag. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And being a part of the solution is a great session drummer. Get in there, keep things going, keep it moving, don't slow things down, and keep the momentum going. And yeah. that's what you've been able to do and yeah, teach. Yeah, tr- try to keep the energy level up. If you'll, uh, anybody that's got uh, Alexa, if you'll look, if you'll ask Alexa to search for um, Can't Find Love, Lionel Richie, demo version. Let's uh, see, li- search for uh, Can't Find Love, demo version by Lionel Richie. And at the beginning, this is, this is, Pretty much what I did on every session. Hey, let's get going. Let's do this. Come on. Like, yeah. Come on. Hey. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, just trying to yeah throw some Back excitement around. in the room to get everybody pumped up. And you're actually you, on a Shania record doing that. Yeah. And you're going. Ah! Yeah. And then, well, that that was for a whole different. <laughs> that was a frustrating. Ah! But uh, I, I can tell that story too. But. But uh, so you'll hear Lionel say, ah, here comes the hook. That's the hook from Paul Lyme. He said, uh, either, uh, either he's ready to go or he had too many beans for lunch, something <laughs> like that. Um, so, uh, but anyway, that song never came out. He never finished it. Uh, wow. You'll hear him sing some lyrics and then he'll just, but they've gone into deep tracks and put out deep tracks too. Yeah. I've even seen you in the studio. I've seen you uh, stand up and. I was sitting there watching you play uh, when you first started doing some of the Lone Star sessions with uh-huh. Dan Huff, and I would sit there right next to you watching, and you'd get up and sort of hop around and kind of get the blood flowing and wiggle your arms and stuff like that. Yeah, I've never I mean, seen a drummer do that. Yeah, well, you sit, if you sit there for two hours, and you concentrate, and you concentrate, and, you, and uh, all of a sudden, it's like Bill Schnee says about mixing. If you start thinking about if Bill Schnee, one of the, one of the greatest uh, engineer producers ever in LA uh, he says you know if I start thinking about a mix too much and I really and I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about it you know, I'm concentrating on it so hard he said I'll listen the next day and it's just like ugh. he said I can't I don't want to think about it that much I want to do what I think is right my first impression is right I think that's right print yeah. it move on right? right so when you sit there uh, for hours, and you're talking about the guitar part, and you're talking about changing the bass part, and the keyboard sound, and you're sitting there, and you're sitting there, and and uh, and you're pretty much ready to get, do your part, and it just gets to a point where you just you start getting stiff, and you don't feel <laughs> yeah. like you can play anymore. You, you yeah. just kind of got to get up and loosen your muscles a little bit. Yeah, you got to get up and loosen up. And then I, I discovered that that would just help me, you know, Throw whatever th- I was thinking out the window and, and kind of start from scratch. Again. Wow, that's awesome. So anyway, just have to kind of shake it out. Yeah. You know? Wow, so. man. Um, gosh, what else can we talk about? Uh, the future of drums and in the studio. I mean, like, uh, what do you think? I know we talked a little bit about it just a second ago about uh, what the whole industry is doing and how how kind of bleak it seems. But um, what do you think the future of? Um, I mean, it could completely turn around as far as live drums in the studio. It seems like kids are kind of liking that now. Yeah, and even well, like things like analog tape and vinyl and stuff like that. I, I certainly hope uh, I certainly hope that comes back. Uh, uh, 
the playing on playing on records. The problem is the cat's out of the bag now, money wise. So uh, you don't have to pay a machine. You don't have to you don't have to pay a computer reuse. You don't have to pay a computer um, residuals. Right. Right. So so from an economic standpoint, it's it's problematic. Uh, from a bean counter standpoint, right? Yeah, you know. Uh, so, the bean counters, and you put a you put a uh, you put a business uh, business degree guy in an A and R position at a record label, and uh, it's harder. It's gotten harder and harder to find people like um, um, Luke Lewis, yeah, who believes so much in the music that it doesn't matter what it takes to make it great. You got to make it great. Yeah, that's a, and and the guys from the '60s and '70s in, uh, um, uh, in L.A. Uh, Richard Perry, one of the greatest pop producers ever. It, it was just it didn't matter what it took. They mm-hmm. would run over budget all the time, but they made great records. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, those. And, and and the the records we go back and that you hear on oldies radio now that were just you don't you have no idea how much work went into those records and now you got some guy sitting there and programming and and put it out oh that sounds kind of cool it sounds sound kind of hip you know that sounds kind of new it's kind of sound yeah. it's not going to sound new five years from now <laughs> right. it's not going to sound new ten years from now it's going to sound like it was made ten years ago and yeah. nobody's going to give a rat's ass about it. Yeah, you 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 have real players, you have real emotion in a record, and the, that's why the records the and talent people, you know that, that's why that's just, yeah the Eagle stuff holds up. Everybody wants to hear Hotel California. You hear it a thousand times a day. It's probably one of the most uh, 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 valuable titles ever written. Yeah, uh, and it, it's it's the cats playing, you know, yeah. uh, and. Um, uh, to me, it, it takes it takes a village to make a great record. Yeah. It doesn't take a guy on a computer. Yeah, and a these a young com- kids on YouTube are making comments like on a '70s song or something. You know, what happened to this kind of music? What this is the greatest music ever? What happened? Yeah. Yeah. And there's your answer right there because people just yeah, it takes a village of people. It takes a village of people to make a great record. Not a guy on a computer. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I just I know they spend a lot of time perfecting their craft, but. Uh, uh, I'm old now, so uh, I love I love the idea of whenever I book a session. When I did uh, John Schneider, so uh, when I produced John Schneider back in uh, in 2018, we got to get back together again. Of course, he was Bo Duke and Duke's Hazard, and we worked together for over 40. You know, worked together for 40 years from Duke's to doing the cast records and then doing his records. And then um, getting back together back in the 90s and him wanting to come back to music. And then he left music again. Then he wanted to come back. And we got him back in Nashville and started doing records on him. And uh, I produced uh, 52 songs on him in 2018. Huh. And the way we did it, he wanted to go so fast. And he, and uh, it, it was right up my alley. I said, we're going to do everything all at once. We're going to do background vocals. You're going to do your vocals. We're going to do everything all at once. So... We took we took uh, Starstruck, and um, uh, we had both studios. We linked both studios together, and when we walked out at the end of the week, we had an album. Wow. The, the whole thing, That's all a done. Lot of material, and then you go back and you mix it and, and uh, fix fix a little of this, fix a little of that. But we would do rehearsals, pre rehearsals with the background vocals, and um, uh, we'd have the same team for that and. And sit with John and myself and work on keys and work on background vocals. Then when they got in, they were familiar with what they were going to do. Yeah. Uh, and the oohs and the ahs and the, and the yeah. different things. Come How up many with inputs are we in. talking? Like uh, board inputs, like at one time? Oh, Ed time. probably had, there was, well, there was probably, I don't know, 12 inputs on drums with electronics yeah. and, and everything. Uh, let's see, 12. And then you got three background and... vocals, 34, 15, 16 with John, then. Uh, Two for keyboards, uh, 1718, two for piano, 1920, uh, two for uh, guitar, 21, 22, another guitar, 23, 24, uh, bass, 25, um, 
I don't know. Oh, that's 30, crazy. Maybe 30. 30 tracks. Oh, 30, that's a lot. There's a lot track. going down at one time. 30 tracks, yeah. And then, of course, and a few overdubs and solos and stuff like that. After. Wow. But, uh, and so you did the, these records kind of the same way, uh, more than once, uh, with John Schneider? 52 songs. 52 songs. I did five albums on them in one year. Wow. Yeah. All the same way, right? Yeah. Where you just I took him to every the, all the best publishers in town. We got material everywhere. And, uh, uh, yeah. I heard you say one time... Uh, I always kind of kept this in my mind. Uh, the way to get people's attention in the studio, start clicking your sticks together, it gets real <laughs> quiet real fast, right? <laughs> yeah, right. when you can't get everybody to pay attention, you go, click, 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 click. click, click. It's one. And yeah. everybody goes, ah. It just gets really quiet all of a sudden. Oh You're like, oh, what? I've, what? Got a what funny, I've got a funny story about this. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> We're doing the CMAs. Uh, this is about four years ago. We're doing the CMA awards, and and uh, we've been the whole band is on stage. We're waiting. <laughs> we're waiting. We're, no, it was CMA Christmas. CMA Christmas uh, about three years ago. We're doing CMA Christmas, which we did uh, with, with a full orchestra, a big band for ten years. Anyway, so uh, we're on stage, and we knew that somebody was going to walk on. Of course, we pre-recorded everything. We're we're shooting now. We're shooting the TV show, and of course the music becomes the timeline, and the and and the everything is shot to the music. So that's why you pre-record the music. Then you got to sit there and look like you're playing, right? So they call it live to tape, I think, right? Uh, live to tape, live to and tape. then and then you have to sideline. If you were singing, they would call it lip syncing. You have right. to look like you're singing what you sang before. But if it's an instrument, it's called sidelining. So so you're sitting there. And the drum set has all got fake heads on it, and you're, you got to look yeah. like you're playing, and and uh, it's just you know part of the Hollywood thing. Anyway, so uh, although down in Nashville, so production's always all the same. So anyway, we knew that the, that uh, Reba or Garth or whoever was going to come on. I think it was Trish, maybe was going to come on, and all, everybody's sitting there talking, and they're sitting there talking. And I looked at, I looked at uh, uh, the guy that was acting like he was playing percussion, and I said, "Watch this." I said, here we go, one, two, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> you saw people come out of their chairs <laughs> at this far, <laughs> jump for their instruments, <laughs> pull up. <laughs> You're like, psych. <laughs> <laughs> it was hysterical. Oh, oh, it was awesome. I got everybody so good. Oh, man. <laughs> It was great. They're like, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they, yeah hated, they hated me for that. <laughs> I had a hernia just then trying to get to my bass. <laughs> trying to get to their instrument. I mean, they wow. levitated. <laughs> God. Okay, that's, awesome. that's enough of that. Well, um, so how much longer are you going to be doing this thing until you, well, until you just I, can't anymore? Yeah, you gonna, I, I, any I, retirement plans? After after 40 years solid in the studio, I got back to where I liked playing live again yeah. after the kids were grown and... And everything they're gone. So whenever I do a tour, I always uh, take Jeannie along. Uh, and of course, being part of the TCB band, going to England, uh, going to Europe a lot. That's the, basically what that is: is a Elvis Presley music with a, like a live screen uh, that well, they synced yeah. up to a live band, right? Yeah, that. But uh, even more than that, we we tour with the TCB band: uh, uh, James Burton and Glenn Harden, and uh, we uh, the guy and uh, the the uh, the Imperials and. Uh, the Holiday Sisters or the Sweet Inspirations, depending on who's on that particular tour, and as many TCB uh, guys that Elvis gave TCB necklaces and bracelets and everything to uh, back when, uh, of course, he was alive. Um, that still, we do Elvis shows with a, a guy out of uh, uh, Vienna uh, named Dennis Jail. And we've toured with Dennis for gosh over. 15, he sings that he's this basically over fifteen years. Yeah, does he does thing. We never work with anybody that wears a costume, uh, a uh, right. jumpsuit. Right. But you know, very respectful. But doing uh, Elvis music and uh, it's uh, the fans love coming out and seeing everybody. And uh, that's great. So we do a lot of that. Although this COVID thing, I've been like everybody else. I've been I've been put in forced retirement. Mm -hmm. You know, I was also musical director for Linda Carter, who was Wonder Woman and. And uh, having worked with her for 40 years as well, uh, we we're just dear, dear friends. And uh, that all got, all those cons all those shows got shut down. Uh, all the shows in Europe got shut down. Um, uh, the studio stuff has started picking back up a little bit. We shot a, a uh, Shania Twain um, a documentary, like I said, it'll be out on Netflix uh, 
uh, soon, and we shot a world percussion documentary called Give Me the Beat. That'll be out on uh, Netflix hopefully soon. And we did a new Shannon Duo record that hopefully will be out Is that right? soon. Oh, and, I love uh, Shannon Duo. So, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, so uh, trying to get it cranked back up again, but thank goodness I'm not dependent on it anymore. And uh, yeah. uh, been spending a lot of time with, with grandkids. I've got eight grandkids now. Oh, so, my gosh. Wow. So life, is, life has really changed. Yeah. <laughs> Do you still get the same thrill going in the studio that you did, you know, say oh. 20 years ago oh, or whatever, yeah. you know, big records? Oh, yeah, being with the guys. And if it's a band, if, I, if I've been called in to just overdub drums, it's, I'm not crazy about that still. I, yeah. I still like being with the cats. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's uh, that, that thrill of hearing Brent Mason playing something or Dan yeah. Huff playing something and, and uh, just hearing it all go down. Uh, yeah. It's just uh, that's that's why I wanted to start. I wanted yeah. to be one of the cats and and hear everybody playing at once. And if I can't do that, if I can't hear everybody all at once, I just it's the funds out of it. Yeah. I had the funds out of it. I just send or not do it. Well, we're all hoping that the industry will the young people will recognize the talent and and want that back again because yeah. they kind of drive the whole industry really what, what yeah. they're willing to accept. And the good thing is uh, they uh, by definition they can't take live playing away from us. So, right. Uh, that's right. Still have uh, to put butts in seats, and have, still so. have to put butts in seats, and uh, and uh, put on a good show, and put on a good show, and yeah. And there's that. That's a whole. That's a whole different skill set than being yeah. in the studio, as you as you know. So, yeah. uh, a whole new set of uh, uh, positives and negatives, I guess you would right. say. Uh, you're gone a lot from home. You spend uh, 22 hours a day. Uh, to be on stage for those sitting two, around, yeah, right. Sit, sitting mm-hmm. around or traveling to be on stage for those two hours of yeah. of bliss, yeah, and doing what you feel like you were put on the planet, what God puts you on the planet to do, right. And the other twenty two hours, you're waiting for those two hours to come back because that's what God put you on the planet to do, right? That's right. And it's like the gladiator waiting in the cages <clears throat> until they put you out to fight the lions and then yeah, put you back again. That's <laughs> exactly right. So, uh, but in the studio, of course, it's a completely different skill set and a completely different set of rules, which some of which we've talked about yeah and, uh, but i'm working on my book now and and uh so uh i'm uh um hopefully we can get that done within the next year I mean, working, what's the title of the book going to be do you know yet i don't know yet i don't i don't know front to back or uh, i've i've thought about what went around came around because mm-hmm. so many times i wanted something or i even dreamed about it and it came to pass. Wow. When I was in high school, I wanted to work with Tom Jones. When I get to L.A., the first guy I work with is Tom Jones. Wow. Um, uh, I, I love the Commodores. I'm working with Kenny Rogers. Lionel Richie comes into the studio and said, this is my band, and I start doing Lionel Richie's records. Wow. I can't explain it. I don't know how that happened. I, I don't... I, it's I just, good karma, I guess. Yeah, right. well... Yeah, we met uh, Michael Lamardian through our church in in, uh, in Van Nuys called Church on the Way. Uh, that's where I met Abraham Laboreal. We had our we had a band. Mitch Holder heard of me from the Doc Severance, and Mitch was doing anyway. It's just on and on and on. It's just this air. It, it, I can't explain it. Well, you are at the top of your craft, and and it shows. It rubs off on people. I mean, people recognize that. They go, you know. And when I was growing up, I always wanted to be. I would hear other people talking about a drummer, saying, "Oh, you should get that guy." And I hungered to be that guy, you know, for so long. I was like, right. I want to be the guy that they say you should get that guy to play drums for. You. And I, that's what I became. Right. Uh, because when before I got with Canyon, the group Canyon back mm-hmm. in the '80s, sure. uh, I had a sound man or somebody to work with me before, and they, he literally said that you've got to get that guy, Keach. You got to get that guy. To play. And just same with with Lone Star. It right. was just I was kind of the guy that sure. could play good live or something. That's wonderful. You know, not a session player, but that's, I had to learn all that along no, the way. No, that's wonderful though. And you, so you. You know, you've you've fulfilled your destiny in life. You wanted to be, uh, you wanted to be who you are, and you made that. And very few people, especially in our business, very few people uh, get to actually be what they want to be. There's a lot of talent out there. I don't know. I don't know how much the difference is for somebody that doesn't break yeah, through. Right. I don't know what that difference is. Um, it, it took me. For the first 25 years of my career, I was I was like, God, I can't believe how busy I am. I can't believe they think I know what I'm doing. Right. right. Yeah. But then after that, then I realized, well, there's 
there's got to be something inside here that I don't even know about that's really good. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just saying I couldn't believe it. I still yeah. can't believe it. I can't believe all I've gotten to, all I've gotten to do. I, I, I look back. Like I say, we're working on my book now. There's a lady that's done a complete forensic analysis of my discography, many wow. things that I've completely forgotten I did. And I can only imagine. It's just like, really? Did I do that? I it's played just, that? <laughs> how many Grammy winners there were? And well, it's been about, about four dub- decades now, right? Four or five, five decades. Five de- decades five of decades, just yeah. every day, just about. Every day. Wow. That is yeah. incredible. So it's been uh, been quite a ride. Yeah. So good to have you here, Paul. Thank you, it's, Thank you it's very so much. amazing. And I will share this little bit of tidbit of information for everybody that I learned from Paul years ago. If you're not early, you're late <laughs> as a drummer. Right. If you're not early to whatever. And because ever since then, every single thing, like a call time in the lobby to go to do sound check or whatever, I'm always early. Yeah. And I just feel like uh, yeah. I have taken that advice uh, very literally. Yeah, the two, the, the two grand advices to everybody is pay yourself first. If you make if you make a hundred bucks, set the first ten dollars aside for yourself. Pay yourself first. Because if it wasn't for you, that ten dollars wouldn't be there. So save ten percent of everything you make. Put it aside now. Right. Pay ten ten percent, set it aside. And then pay everybody else second. Pay your light bill, pay your phone bill, pay your house bill after you pay yourself because you're the most important one. Right. Uh, and then that's that's your financial bit of advice and invest it. And second second is if you're not 30 minutes early, you're late. You're late. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, you, you get there, yeah. everybody's kind of nervous and you're trying to shuffle to get things done. But if you're early, you're relaxed, you feel yeah. good, you know. Yeah. So that was a yeah. very, very good bit of advice. Well, Thank you so much yeah. for... Spending time with me. I know this has been a long podcast, but it's worth every second. So, Well, my honor to be here. And, and Keach, I wish you uh, the best going forward with uh, Lone Star and whatever else you decide to do. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, this has been Designated Drummer, and uh, albeit a long one, but it's a really good one. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody, for uh, listening. Sorry we took so long. See you. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.